Palaroga Shark Media. Hi, and welcome to Entertainment Plus, a short roundup of the top entertainment stories in today's news. On Wednesday, Larry David, the star and creator of Curb Your Enthusiasm, expressed his sorrow over the loss of his close friend, Richard Lewis. The news of Lewis's passing at the age of 76 was initially brought to public attention by Bette Midler on X and later confirmed by Variety. In a heartfelt tribute, David, aged 76, reflected on the deep bond he shared with Lewis, likening their relationship to that of siblings. Richard and I were born three days apart in the same hospital, and for most of my life he's been like a brother to me. David revealed in a statement released by HBO. Lewis, known for his role in 41 episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm out of the 114 aired, including the 2000 special that laid the groundwork for the series, was portrayed as one of David's closest friends on the show, despite their comedic bickering. David reminisced about Lewis's unique nature, stating, He had that rare combination of being the funniest person and also the sweetest, but today he made me sob, and for that I'll never forgive him. The announcement in 2021 that Lewis would not be returning to Curb for its 11th season due to recovery from multiple surgeries saddened many fans, though he eventually made a brief reappearance and returned more prominently in the 12th and final season. At that time, Lewis had been diagnosed with Parkinson's, a fact he did not disclose until April of 2023. Cheryl Hines, another longtime collaborator on Curb who played David's wife and later ex-wife, also paid tribute to Lewis. Sharing a photo of them together, she reminisced about her admiration for him, saying, When I was young, I had the biggest crush on Richard Lewis. He was the funniest person on stage and the most handsome comedian. Working with Lewis on Curb fulfilled a dream for Hines, who discovered the depth of Lewis' kindness and warmth over the years. He would take time to tell the people he loved what they meant to him, especially in recent years, Hines shared, adding, To be loved by Richard Lewis was a true gift. I love you, Richard. A lawsuit has been filed against Andy Cohen and Bravo claiming widespread cocaine use within the network. The suit, initiated by former Real Housewives of New York City star Leah McSweeney, alleges that Cohen, a key producer and on-screen figure at Bravo, not only consumes cocaine himself but also shares it with employees, including the housewives he oversees. The legal documents, scrutinized by page six, suggest Cohen provides preferential treatment and advantageous editing to those housewives he engages in drug use with, aiming to present them in a more favorable light. According to McSweeney's claims in the lawsuit, Cohen's actions are part of a broader network culture that normalizes and encourages drug and alcohol consumption, thereby neglecting the needs of employees striving to remain sober. Cohen's representative has outright denied these allegations, stating to DailyMail.com that the claims against him are completely false. McSweeney, who participated in two seasons of The Real Housewives of New York City in 2020 and 2021 and appeared in Real Housewives The Ultimate Girls Trip last year, points out in the lawsuit that Bravo's operational model heavily relies on substance use, though she didn't specify any individuals beyond Cohen. Before joining the series, McSweeney had informed Bravo's producers of her commitment to sobriety and her ongoing 30-day sober streak. Despite this, she contends that the producers did not support her sobriety efforts, but instead supplied her with unlimited free alcoholic beverages and encouraged their consumption. The lawsuit further states that this environment led to McSweeney's relapse into alcohol addiction shortly after she began filming for season 12. McSweeney accuses Bravo producers of deliberately undermining her sobriety and obstructing her attempts to seek treatment for her addiction. By doing so, she argues, Bravo executives violated her employment rights under the Disabilities Act. Additionally, McSweeney, who owns the fashion label Married to the Mob, alleges in her lawsuit that sexual harassment is rampant at Bravo. She claims a senior producer frequently sent unsolicited explicit images to junior production staff an issue she says executives have consistently overlooked. Jennifer Lopez's documentary, The Greatest Love Story Never Told, premiered on Tuesday, offering viewers a glimpse into the emotional struggles she has faced since childhood in the Bronx. Central to both the documentary and the related musical film, This Is Me Now, are the personal battles Lopez has endured. She candidly discusses feeling neglected as the middle child among her two sisters, Leslie and Linda, which propelled her into becoming a diligent worker to gain recognition. Jennifer also touches on the difficulties of growing up with the narcissistic mother, described as the life of the party, and a father who was often absent due to his night shifts, leaving him to sleep through the day. While her parents, Guadalupe and David, do not appear in the documentary, they are remembered through flashback photos. 
A notable moment in the film features Jennifer's friend Jane Fonda, whom she met on the set of Monster in Law. Fonda expresses her hopes for Jennifer's relationship with Ben Affleck, humorously noting that J-Lo is thirsty, a comment that brings laughter to the singer. The documentary delves into Jennifer's journey towards self-love after three divorces and extensive therapy, highlighting this as the overarching theme of her work. Jennifer admits to periods of low self-esteem, a hurdle she worked hard to overcome. Ben Affleck contributes to the narrative, pointing out that social media validation is insufficient for healing inner turmoil, a sentiment he mirrors with a reference to his own struggles with alcohol, emphasizing the necessity of personal effort in overcoming such challenges. In the 1990s, working on Roseanne Barr's show came with unique challenges, as detailed by TV writer Stan Zimmerman in his new book, The Girls from Golden to Gilmore. Zimmerman, who has contributed to Golden Girls, Gilmore Girls and Roseanne, shared insights into Roseanne's notorious management style. He revealed that Roseanne and her then-husband, Tom Arnold, developed a system to avoid learning the names of their staff. They had made T-shirts for us, numbered T-shirts, Zimmerman recounted. The purpose, he explained, was to facilitate firings without the need for names. Since my birthday is October 13th, I counted and stood in line to get number 13, he added, noting the degrading nature of the act. Despite the discomfort it caused, Zimmerman humorously noted, I cherish it, indicating he still possesses the shirt. Zimmerman also touched on the show's high staff turnover and shared survival tips from former writers such as hiding behind taller colleagues to evade Roseanne's notice. If Roseanne couldn't see the whites of your eyes, she couldn't fire you, he shared. The atmosphere on set was tense, not just for writers, but actors too. Zimmerman mentioned Laurie Metcalf's reluctance to interact with writers out of fear for her job. The actors rarely talked to the writers when we came down to the stage to watch the afternoon run-throughs, he observed, recounting a personal attempt to engage Metcalf in conversation that resulted in a mere grin. According to the complexities of working on Roseanne, Zimmerman claimed that Roseanne herself was absent for two weeks due to upcoming electric shock treatments, a revelation that surprised him. Up until then, I didn't know they still did that. I thought there was something done to old Hollywood movie stars like Francis Farmer. Zimmerman expressed shedding light on the challenges behind the scenes of the popular sitcom. More in a moment. Where is Kate Middleton? For two months, the press has gone along with the official version that Kate had abdominal surgery and was recovering. But William's sudden change of plans this week has shifted the narrative with the tabloids now wondering where the princess is. The Mirror went as far as printing, One particularly bizarre theory suggested the princess is actually in Miami, where she is recuperating from a Brazilian butt lift. The Mirror added, Another theory suggested Kate is Banksy, while yet another said she has donated a kidney to the king. Banksy, it should be noticed, has not been heard from since Kate went in the hospital. The news.co.au broke ranks reporting that in early February, journalist Concha Caleja turned up on Spanish TV to say that she had spoken to an aide from the royal household in a completely off-the-record manner and that the princess had been in great danger after the operation. Caleja reportedly said the doctors had to take drastic decisions at that moment because of the complications that arose. The decision was to put her in an induced coma, they had to intubate her. There were serious complications that they didn't expect because the operation went well, but the post-operative period didn't go so well. The concern in the royal household was palpable. It was about saving her life. A palace source told the Times, it's total nonsense. It's fundamentally totally made up. And I'll use polite English here. It's absolutely not the case. Kate has not been seen since Christmas, which is, of course, Christmas, a day when the royals are normally seen. The palace is sticking with Kate continues to be doing well. A representative told Page Six, Kensington Palace made it clear in January the timelines of the princess recovery and we'd only be providing significant updates. That guidance stands. They also added the language that Kate is doing well. And there you have it. Please follow us on Spotify, Apple, or your app of choice. And if you like the show, hit those five stars and give us a good review. I'm Mark Francis. My thanks to John McDermott. This is Entertainment Plus. Entertainment Plus.